Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to My Victory. Let's welcome everyone that's watching us online or on Facebook Live. Welcome to all of you guys. Give them a hand. We are in part three of a series we began on Easter Sunday called Scars, and we've been investigating this one idea, this one thought, that Jesus, who had the power to beat death and to rise again from the dead, chose for some reason to keep his scars from the, the incredible and terrific, uh, tragic um, crucifixion that he went through. And we know that if he kept his scars, he had the power to, to erase and give himself a new body, we know that. But if he chose to keep his scars, he chose to keep them on purpose for a purpose. And we've been discovering some of those purposes. We've been noticing that those purposes are mainly for you and I in some way, that he's always got us on his mind and always wants to, you know, there's a purpose behind everything he does in reflection to how it affects you and I. Now, the first thing we looked at a couple weeks ago was a story of, of Thomas and how Thomas was not, you know, in present when Jesus first showed up and appeared to his disciples. And when, when the, he got back and his disciples, the disciples began talking to Thomas and saying, we saw Jesus, we saw Jesus, and they're all excited. And he's like, I don't believe you. I, I don't get it. I, I don't see it. Unless I physically see with my own eyes, unless I touch the wounds in his hands and, and put my hand in, in his side and the wound there, I'm not going to believe. Well, sure enough, Jesus shows up just a little while later and says, hey, Thomas, you know, here, here it is. You know, feel free and kind of gross, but do you want to put your finger in there? Put your finger in there, okay? And, and Thomas was, was awestruck and my, his response was, my Lord and my God. And we realize that in the process of, of this, if, if Jesus kept his scars just for Thomas, that would have been enough. That Jesus loves you and I individually that much that if it was just you and just, or just me, that he would have gone through the same thing, done the same thing in the same way for just you and I. That he loved Thomas just enough. If it was just for Thomas, he loved Thomas just enough to keep his scars for eternity just to help Thomas believe. That's how much Jesus loves you and I individually, which is awesome. Now, Thomas has been labeled, you know, unfortunately for, you know, centuries now as Doubting Thomas. We know him as Doubting Thomas because he doubted before he saw. And we said, well, it's not fair to have those labels. Well, last week we looked at another guy who was wrongly labeled by somebody he trusted and somebody that he looked up to, and that was the Apostle Paul. That was, you know, Paul was his pastor and John Mark's pastor, and John Mark was a young, you know, up-and-coming leader in, in the early church, and and he abandoned Paul apparently a little bit sooner than Paul expected. And, and, and when it came time for their next trip, Paul said, no, I don't want anything to do with John Mark. He left me last time. He's going to leave me this time. And, and labeled, I mean, John Mark is carrying this label as a quitter, as somebody who gave up, as a coward, whatever it might be, because he had a religious leader, somebody that was supposed to be close to God, somebody that he trusted label him incorrectly. And we learned last week, that your scars, you have a choice, that you can hide your scars. Many of you and I, we have a tendency of hiding our scars and being ashamed of our scars. And yet, we looked at the picture of a lion last week where all, his face is all scarred up. And we said that lion is either a failure or a fighter. And when you look at that lion, what do you see? And most of us respond, we, we see a fighter. We see, you know, a, a lion that's, that's a fighter. He's been through battles. He's been through that and. John Mark was a fighter, because it, and, and Thomas was a fighter, and despite being labeled, you know, and, and wrongly labeled, they decided that they were going to carry on and continue on with their mission, and, that, and, and continue on with their calling and their destiny, and despite those labels, they were going to fight their way through, and both of them did. Which reminds me of a, of a quote I read recently, and I, and I love it, and I think it's very appropriate with what we've got, scars are tattoos with better stories. Isn't that good? Scars are tattoos with better stories. And today, we've got somebody with a better story. In Genesis 25, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. If you, if you don't, you can follow along with, with me on the screen. Genesis 25, we see Isaac, who is Abraham's son, pray to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And the Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. 
Okay? Then it says this, the babies jostled each other within her. So we've got multiple babies jostled within each, each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? Which I think is the prayer of every pregnant woman at the end of her term. Why is this happening to me, oh God? Or they look at us guys and saying, why did you do this to me? Um, so she went to inquire of the Lord after she blames him. It's nice. Um, anyway, <laughs> verse 23, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. She's like, well, no wonder I'm so big. Anyway, um, <laughs> two peoples from within you will be separated, and one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Interesting prophecy, and we'll see that come about in, in a moment. Verse 24 says this, When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb, and the first came out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. Anybody else think it's strange that she gave birth to Chewbacca? <laughs> I'm thinking, what kind of... Anyway, a hairy baby, red... Hey, what in the world? Anyway, it's moving along. Verse 26. After this, his brother came out, and his hand was grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Now, we, we, this is a familiar name today. There's, there's people named Jacob today. This is, this is familiar, but we don't see the meaning or the power of what this name means. I'll explain it in a minute, because Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Now, see, the name Jacob literally translated means heel grabber, okay, which which is great for the rest of his life. Every time mom calls him, every time dad calls him, every time his brother calls him, every time his friends call him or talk to him, they're reminding him that he was second best. See, that might not mean, I mean, being born second today as a twin, not really that big a deal. But in this day, in this day and age, it was really a big deal, especially because this was the first child and this was the first sons. And the first son born was what received all of the inheritance, received all of the blessing from the father, received the namesake. All of this was handed off to the first son. And, but, I mean, which is bad enough. But Jacob is reminded every time they call his name, Jacob's reminded. Basically, what Jacob means in this thing is it reminds him, is basically saying, loser. Hey, loser. You know, because second place, this is my football coach coming out. Second place is first loser. And forever and ever, he's, he's going to be named loser. Now watch. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter and a man of the open country, probably because he was so hairy. You wouldn't want him, you wouldn't want him in the kitchen. Ew. Yeah, body hair nets. That's not going to work. Anyway. While Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. This is, I love this because this is biblical language for mama's boy. That's what he's saying, mama's boy. And, and Moses is like, how do I put this? As he's writing, how, how do I word this? He stayed at home among the tents. Okay. It gets worse. Verse 28 says this. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, always win a man's heart through food. Anyway, loved Chewbacca, I mean Esau. <laughs> but Rebecca loved Jacob. See, mama's boy. Now, this is a big deal because Jacob, forever called loser, every time someone calls his name, forever called second best, forever called heel grabber, is reminded of how he doesn't measure up. And to make matters worse, his dad loves Esau, not him, which is a big deal, especially to a young boy growing up. I mean, there's something about no, nobody loves like a mom. Is that right? But there's something that we all intrinsically value in our dad's love and affection and, and respect. 
whether your dad is good or bad, there's something we're always trying to live up to and trying to, to do that just naturally in, built inside each one of us. And Jacob received the ultimate rejection. I mean, so much so it's recorded in history and in the Bible how he wasn't good enough for dad. Now, the question I have for you this morning is, have you ever felt rejection from someone close to you? Have you ever been hurt by someone who should have been loving you the most? And maybe it's a parent like Jacob where you just simply couldn't measure up and you just didn't get the affection you expected or the, 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 the attention and the time and Maybe you got abused and mistreated or whatever. Someone that should have loved you. Isaac and Rebecca prayed for children, but yet when the children came, he didn't love Jacob. And Jacob's thinking, it's not my fault I was born second. It's not my fault that they named me loser. It's not my fault that that I'm not a naturally good hunter. It's not my fault. And yet the rejection and the pain and the wound that he, that he carried would have been so deep. And, and, and the question is, maybe you have a parent, like maybe you have a spouse that somebody that you, that you loved and you said one day at the altar that men till death do us part and then they turned on you and then all of a sudden the person that's supposed to love you and care for you the most is hurting you the most. How did we get here? And it's a wound that's just so, it's a pain that's so too deep. It's too hard to care. And the question is, what do you do with that pain? What do you do with that rejection? And I implore you to not do what Jacob did with it. Because what Jacob did with it is Jacob took this pain and this rejection and he, he allowed it to become bitterness and unforgiveness and, and this, this terrible form of bitterness inside of him. In fact, Jacob spent the next number of years after this, this event, he spent the next number of years tricking and deceiving and, and lying his way and, and trying to, to, to always best Esau. And, and he tricked Esau one day into, into signing over his birthright when Esau came back from a long hunt and was, was famished and Jacob was built and making a stew because he was a cook and mom taught him and, and all the rest of it. And it was very, it smelled good. It was very good. And, and Esau was so hungry and, and Jacob held out on the stew and said, until you sign over your birthright, I'm not going to feed you. And eventually Esau signed it over. And then later, at the end of Isaac's life, when Isaac's sight went and, and Jacob, Jacob, you know, dressed up like Esau. And how, what he did is he, they killed a goat. And, and how hairy is this guy? And what does he smell like that they skin a goat, a hairy goat, and they put all the, you know, the, the hide on, on Jacob's arms and so that his dad would touch him and on his face. I mean, how hairy is this guy? We're going to be shocked when we get to heaven and Chewbacca's there. It's like, oh. <laughs> Chewy? Wow. No idea. And, and, and yet... <laughs> And then he tricks dad into signing over and giving the blessing. And Esau was a little bit upset. In fact, so upset, he says, I'm going to kill that kid. I'm going to kill him. And Jacob hears this and flees for his life and runs for, for years and years. He has to run and, and escape from, from Esau because he allowed the bitterness in his own heart. And thank God that God interrupted him on his journey and kind of got a hold of Jacob. And what's amazing is God shows up one night in, in a dream to Jacob and, and, and then, you know, and speaks to him there. And then God shows up uh, another time and, and as like an angel and they wrestle back and forth. And, and God changes, which is amazing, God changes Jacob's name. In other words, the label that he had been given since birth, not his fault, not even something he did. He just was given a label unfairly. Second best, heel grabber, loser. And God says, I don't see you like that. Even after Jacob lived up to that name, even after Jacob wasn't good enough himself, even after Jacob was a deceiver and a liar and cheater and all the rest of it, God says, hey, I, I, I still see you 
as Israel, as potential. I still see you as the father of a nation. And, and, and Israel, the nation today, is named after Jacob because God changed his name. It doesn't matter what your past We serve a God that no matter what your past is, no matter what you've done, he doesn't see you according to that. He sees you according to your potential, according to what he's called you to be, not according to the labels you're wearing. Now, it's amazing. But some of you are saying, okay, well, that, that's the happy end of the story. Not really, but because it goes on. But something happens here. Jacob decides to let go of the bitterness. And here's, here's the truth. Is that the truth is that scars are evidence of closure. There's a difference between a wound and a scar. You see, a scar is, is a physical wound that has no more blood, no more scabs, it's just skin. Okay? It's been healed. It's, it's, sign, it's evidence of closure. An emotional wound cannot heal if there's unforgiveness or bitterness. See, there's many nurses and doctors in, in our church, and they can attest that, that something that's, uh, that, that there, if there's an infection in a wound, the wound won't heal. And the infection in our emotional wounds is bitterness. The bitterness acts like an infection and doesn't allow your wounds to heal. That unforgiveness and bitterness will keep you in the pain and in the, in the loss. And you have, you have a choice to make. You have to forgive. And you're thinking, but Pastor Kelly, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what they did to me. You, how in the world am I supposed to forgive? Well, here's how to forgive. Number one is you need to look into the face of the person who hurt you and see instead the face of Jesus who showed you mercy when nobody else would have given you another chance. You need to look at that. You know, how in the world could I look into their face and see Jesus? Are you kidding me? Well, later on, the where I got this from is later on, Jacob and Esau, eventually, years later, I mean, Jacob's married him multiple times and has children already by this time. Years and years later, they meet up again. And Jacob is terrified because he still thinks Esau is going to kill me, and he's terrified, and he comes and he brings these gifts, and they meet up and brings all these gifts and trying to win Esau over, and Esau's like, hey, he, Esau does something unexpected. He runs towards Jacob and embraces him and hugs him and starts crying and is like, I'm so glad to see you. And look at how Jacob responds to that response. He says, no, please, said Jacob, if I have found favor truly in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For, look at this, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God now that you have received me favorably. In other words, he says, when I see forgiveness like how you've forgiven me, that's like God. That's how God's forgiven me. That's as close to God as I've ever come, is I look into your face. Now, remember, Jacob, by this time, has already seen God face to face. He's wrestled with him. And he's like, Esau, when I see forgiveness in you, I see God. And how to forgive, number two, is you need to realize that before the day, the week, the month, or the year is out, you'll be the one needing mercy yourself. Now the truth is it's much easier to forgive a stranger. But what happens when the one who hurt you is close to you? How do you forgive? How do you ever get to that place? What is forgiveness? Well, Dr. Archibald Hart said this. He says, forgiveness is giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. It's giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. Now, before you're going, Pastor Kelly, you just don't know. You just haven't been there. You don't know how badly they hurt me. I want, I want to read you an excerpt from a book called The Hiding Place, written by Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom was, was a survivor of the Holocaust. She was a Jewish girl who, who you know, was young when the Holocaust happened, World War II happened, and she was imprisoned in one of the, the, the concentration camps. Her, she watched her sister's and her mother and father be killed in front of her. 
And yet at the end she survived and years later she's preaching in a church and look at this, she's preaching in a church and watch what happens. This is what she wrote. It was a church service in Munich that I saw him. The former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time. And suddenly it was all there. The room full of mocking men the heaps of clothing, Betsy's pain-blanched face. Betsy is her sister. He came up to me at the church as the church was emptying and beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said, to think that as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine, and I, who had preached so often to the people in Broomendale that the, the need to forgive kept my hand by my side. And even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus had died for this man, and was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I, raised, I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. The story says that she then forced herself to take his hand. And as she did, the most incredible thing happened. She says this, from my shoulder along my arm through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness anymore than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. And when he tells us to love our enemies, he gives along with the command the love itself. Isn't that amazing? That when he asks us to love our enemies, when he asks us to forgive, he gives us the strength to do it ourselves. You have to do it with God. There's no other way. It's just too deep. But here's the truth. If you don't forgive, if you don't forgive, it's not a scar you're carrying. It's an open wound. And the truth is, is that your past wounds... Here's today's takeaway. Your past runes can paralyze you or propel you. The choice, and forgiveness is a choice, the choice is yours. And the good news is this. You don't have to go it alone. You don't have to. Do, you can do it with God. Now watch this. This is the most amazing verse that I f- saw in this whole story of Jacob. I have read this verse a hundred times, but I never got it until this time. You know that God knows about your hurt. God knows about your wounds. God knows every little detail. God knows how much pain it caused you. God knows the frustration. God knows how difficult it is for you to forgive. You know why I know that? Because look at this verse. A couple of chapters after Jacob's on the run. There above it stood the Lord. Jacob's having his dream. And and the Lord said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. Now I've read this a hundred times, but I never caught something before Notice what what God didn't say. God said this, I am the God of your father, Abraham. That's his grandfather. But he doesn't say, and the God of your father, Isaac. He just simply says, I'm the God of Isaac. Because God knew Isaac was never a father to Jacob. God knew the pain and the hurt God, in this one simple statement, said, you're not doing this alone, Jacob. I understand. I'm there with you. I get it. But you need to be free. Because forgiveness is not about freeing them. Forgiveness is about freeing you. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the hope in them. I thank you for the life that they bring. And I thank you, God, that you don't hide these imperfections in the Bible, the breakdowns, the, the, 
the faults of Isaac as a father. You didn't hide that from us. You put that in plain sight in the Bible. Showed us the imperfections of them all. Showed us the pain Jacob went through. Showed us the process that he had to go through to get to his freedom and healing. And God, I thank you so much. Because that shows us, God, if you did it there, you can do it with, with us. And God, help us to take our wounds and see healing and bring healing with forgiveness. That we can carry our scars. In Jesus' name. Amen. The thing with the scar is that it's a reminder of what you've been through. And the fact is, is let's get over this whole idea that if I forgive, I have to forget. It's not possible. But there's a difference from remembering with a wound than remembering with a scar. One is healed, one is not. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus yet, you need to invite him right into the middle of your world, of your life. He wants relationship with you. You don't need to carry your wounds or your, your past alone. He cares, he knows, he loves. He wants relationship with you. And all you need to do to begin that relationship is confess with your mouth that Jesus is God and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you'll be saved. I'm going to lead us in a prayer so powerful. If you pray this prayer with me, you're going to confess that Jesus is God. And if you believe what you're praying is true, right here, right now, you can begin a relationship, one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with God. I invite everyone to pray this with me, everyone online, everyone on Facebook, pray this with me. Repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I confess that you are God. And I believe that you rose again from the dead. And I ask you right now to become my God, my Lord, my Savior, my friend. I thank you for forgiving me of all my sins, for accepting me just as I am, wounds and all. I give my heart to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask everyone to keep their eyes closed and heads bowed. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, I don't want to embarrass anybody or call you out. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, everyone else's eyes are closed and heads bowed. If you just shoot up your hand until I see it and say, yeah, I, I pray this prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look around one more time, make sure I didn't miss anyone. Man, isn't God good? Thank you.